Every evening in Africa, sunset draws the curtain on a daily drama of light and shadow that plays out in acts of life and death under the harsh African sky. As the burning sun sinks into a molten red horizon, a fragile peace spreads with the glow across the land. Gentle evening breezes cool the hot earth, and water holes are busy with animals taking their last drink as dusk moves slowly toward night. This quiet transition separates two distinctly different cycles of life, and every evening, the changing of the guard is a subtle shift in the mood of Africa. As the darkness gathers, the animals of the day grow ever more alert and watchful, fearing the uncertainty of the coming night. These animals prepare to surrender the stage to different players. The night belongs to the hunters, and the predators of the night are ruled by a monarch whose veins run rich with the royal blood of Africa the African lion. The cycles of life in nature are endless. Every new dawn brings release from the fears that stalk the night and new challenges to survival. Just as every year is a cycle of seasons and events, successes and failures, triumphs and tragedies. This is the story of two prides of lionesses living out a year in vastly different parts of southern Africa the wild and remote Savuti Plains of northern Botswana and the Kruger National Park of South Africa. It is here in the shadow of some low hills at a place called Munshi, where our first study pride hold the territory that has been passed down by their mothers and grandmothers before them. This is the home of the Munshi pride. Our story begins after the savage dry years of the early 90s, when the area was in the grip of the most devastating drought in living history. Everywhere across the bleak landscape, herds of gaunt animals are strung out like ghostly caravans, shuffling wearily through the dust. While others, little more than slow-moving corpses, search for nutrition in the dry ground. The few remaining water holes have dried to muddy patches of rank-smelling sludge containing little or no surface water. Food stocks are almost at an end. Only desperate foraging of dry twigs and dusty grass roots sustains the rapidly weakening survivors until the land once more feels the soothing balm of rain. In this desert-like valley is a small collection of pools fed by underground wells. And it is here that the females of the Munchi pride have taken up residence during the drought. Nine months ago, they both gave birth to cubs that have now grown into sturdy and playful youngsters. The dominant female is named Nialeti, a word in the local Shungan dialect for star after the light patch on her chest. Nialetti and her sister are close partners in the shared responsibility of raising their seven cubs. While the dry conditions are harsh on most of the bushveld animals, it is a time of plenty for the lions, who take advantage of slowed reactions and weakened limbs. The two sisters have changed their normal nocturnal habits and have become experts at daytime ambush hunting. Every morning, the herds start to gather in large numbers at the waterholes, and the lionesses stalk into position. 
Here they wait patiently for an opportunity to present itself. Sensing the right moment to strike, Nialetti eases forward, eyes fixed on an unwary victim, muscles bunched and ready to spring. A sharp alarm call betrays the lion's presence before they break the cover. When the nervous herds bolt in panic, the lioness relaxes, easing down back into position. When the charge does come, the hunters will still miss nine times out of ten, but the small amount of energy used with each attempt allows many more chances to force the error from already weakened prey. Occasionally, the territorial males of the area will join the pride. When this happens, the females will often drive animals toward the males, who sometimes manage a token effort at cooperation, but usually prove to be more of a hindrance than a help. These two huge lions are the fathers of the Munchi Pride cubs. On their regular visits, they pay close attention to the scent marks left by the lionesses, gleaning information on the sexual condition of their mates. Competition between alliances of males for the mating rights to a pride is intense. If a female within their territory is receptive, they will mate with her immediately ensuring that it is their genes carried through to the next generation. With the hunting over for the morning, the females retire to the shade of some nearby trees to rest, patiently discouraging the cubs' efforts to cajole them into a game. Like athletes in training, their young muscles must be constantly stretched and exercised. Every burst of speed, every tumble and every turn strengthens limbs and sharpens reactions. Holds and techniques learned from watching their mothers hunt are practiced on brothers and sisters. Early tests of strength establish a hierarchy that will ensure discipline for effective teamwork when they are ejected from the pride and must hunt without their mothers. During the course of the day, the waterholes are visited by elephants, one of the few animals that the lion's presence does not deter. These giants can drink more than 50 gallons a day, and groups of young bulls gather to bathe and enjoy the cool water. Splashing themselves with mud helps to relieve the irritation from biting insects and moistens their skin against the powerful African sun. The areas they trample on the edge of the water provide drinking spots for flocks of turtle doves. Droppings left in the shallows are hotly contested perches safe from predators that lie in wait on the shore. And soon there begins a build-up of air traffic. Dung beetles make carefully packed balls of the precious waste which they industriously roll away for their mates to lay eggs in. Through the evening and into the night, peace reigns at the water hole. At dawn, Nialetti is preparing herself for the hunt, sharpening her claws on the rough bark of an acacia tree and stretching her lithe body. She spots a herd of wildebeest gathering at the water and stalks carefully through the low cover, circling into position. Choosing the right moment, she launches herself at full speed in a blinding display of power right into the midst of the panicking animals.
This time, the dust and chaos have worked to her advantage, and she has captured a young wildebeest. She hangs on grimly with a powerful neck bite subduing the animal, but curiously making no attempt to finish it off. In a remarkable display of maternal behavior, she has judged that this animal is just the right size upon which her youngsters can practice their killing technique. Nialetti and her sister keep the struggling animal pinned down, and the youngsters are called in for an experience that will take them another step closer to independence. When feeding begins, it is fast and furious. The males are not far off, and the pride knows that they must eat as much as possible before their meal is taken from them. This is the price the family pays for protection of the youngsters who would be killed or chased off if new males should take over the pride. The drought is slowly wearing into its third year. Herds of animals are spending most of their day around the water holes now, waiting listlessly in the meager shade of bare trees until the cool of evening when they will drink. They are not moving away to feed anymore. Energy is too precious to be wasted in fruitless searching. If the rains don't arrive, the survivors that have made it this far in the cruel heat will no longer be able to carry on. In the evening, a relieving breeze begins to stir the stifling air, bringing the sweet scent of life-giving rain. Lightning flashes across the night sky. Every day, the storms on the horizon move closer until heavy drops begin to fall on the dry ground. Within days, new life begins to sprout through the now soaked earth. And two months later, once dry riverbeds have swollen to muddy torrents rolling through green riverine forest. Out in the open, the rain continues to lash down on the animals of the grasslands, both predator and prey. The generation of this once barren land is remarkable. Herds are beginning to gather again, and on the plains, the miracle of new life is taking place. Fresh arrival in the wildebeest herd is greeted by his family, and within five minutes, watched by his anxious mother, he is already able to run should danger threaten. The incredible reproductive strategy of the impala has evolved for just such a time. Females that became pregnant weeks apart, some seven months earlier, synchronize hormonally to give birth to all the lambs in the herd within 72 hours of each other. 
This floods the market and predators can only gorge themselves on a very small percentage of the newborn. During the day, the lambs are kept together in large nurseries while mothers graze close at hand. The rain has brought new life everywhere. At a hyena den nearby, boisterous pups, some still in the black coats of infancy, play with their patient mother. Hyena females each give birth to two pups who are raised in the communal den. The mothers take turns at protecting the young from scavengers, like the ever-present black-backed jackal. These sharp-eyed hunters live mostly off rodents and insects, but are alert for any unguarded morsel that may come their way. A newborn vervet monkey explores his surroundings, safe from harm in mother's embrace. Even the elephant herds have little ones to take care of and protect. Baboon families feed greedily on fallen marula berries, a succulent, nutritious fruit that is produced in rich abundance after heavy rains. Each fruit is carefully peeled to expose the juicy inner pulp under the bitter skin and then eaten with obvious relish. Overhead, birds gather in their thousands to feed on another bounty that the rains bring, flying termites. These protein-rich insects emerge after thunder showers to disperse and start new colonies. But even before their nuptial flight begins, millions of them are picked off by waiting predators. The oxpecker vigorously combs the fur of large antelope for the larvae of ticks that hatch in the moist grass. Perhaps the most content of all are the warthogs, with mud aplenty for their new brood to enjoy. Nearby, a group of vultures are gathering at the remains of a fresh kill on the outskirts of the Munchi Pride territory. Two pairs of huge lappet-faced vultures, the largest of all African birds of prey, squabble viciously in a battle for dominance over the meager remains of a small impala. During the wet season, circumstances have changed dramatically for the munchy pride. And lying nearby, watching the remains of their meal disappear, are four young lions, the only remaining survivors of the munchy pride cubs. During the months of the rains, the fathers of the munchy cubs have been ousted by another alliance of large black-maned males. The newcomers have killed three of the cubs and chased the rest out of their home territory. Nialetti and her sister have come back into Estrus, and the new king begins his own era in this ancient bloodline. After the summer, when we return to the Kruger, we will see the results of this union. In the meantime, the Munchi Pride cubs are truly on their own. Twelve hundred miles away on the open plains of the Savuti Marsh in Botswana, a spectacular natural phenomenon is taking place. Every year at this time, thousands of zebra migrate to Savuti from the north to feed on the rich grasses of the plains. They pass through here in the company of other grazing animals, gaining condition on nutritious fodder and drinking at pools that are filled with fresh rainwater. After a short time, they move on, following the rains south toward the Mababi Depression, where many of them will give birth. 
This annual surplus of game is followed closely by scores of predators. And dominating the central territory on the plains is our second study group of lionesses, Myomi's pride. There are eight adult females in the pride, a formidable group of hunters who have held sway over this area for more than a decade. Myomi is the dominant female and a savage defender of her group. Smudge, named for a bare patch of skin on her top lip, is Myomi's faithful and ever alert companion. Most of the other lionesses in the group are daughters and granddaughters of these inseparable queens of the marsh. A large number of adults in an open area such as Savuti is an adaptation to a style of hunting completely different from that of the Munchi pride. After spending the whole day asleep in the Mopani bushes surrounding the marsh, they slowly get moving in the early evening. Stretching and yawning loosens muscles in limbs and jaws as they languidly prepare for the night's hunt. Like most lions, Myomi and her pride spend more than three quarters of their day inactive conserving energy for the intensely demanding business of killing for a living. As the light begins to fade and brilliant color washes the evening skies, the females step out onto the edge of the marsh. They wait together here for a while, as if to enjoy the transition from day to night while rejoicing in the strength that their unity brings. Setting off into the dark, they move like a single unit, communicating by subtleties of body language learned from years of hunting together every night. They stop frequently, relying on acute hearing to locate zebra moving on the marsh. Splitting up and melting into the darkness, the pride surrounds and closes in on the herd. Naomi's pride are experts at teamwork, and soon the zebra they have captured is wrestled down, where Smudge applies a powerful throat bite, choking off the struggling animal's life-giving air. With sunrise in the morning, the feast is almost ended. Like most large predators, lions gorge themselves when meat is plentiful. This behavior allows them to go days without feeding if necessary. But a hugely distended stomach is uncomfortable to live with and makes breathing very difficult. One of the young females drags the carcass into the cover of some nearby bushes an instinctive behavior that hides the meat from the prying eyes of vultures whose presence would alert other predators and scavengers to the kill. Sharp-eyed hooded vultures are the first to arrive. They are small enough to fly early in the morning without the aid of thermals that lift larger birds into the air later in the day. Although they get sufficient moisture from the blood of their victims, Lions will often leave a kill if there is water nearby. Myomi, easily identified by her missing black tail tuft, arrives at the water and takes a long, cool drink 
to wash down another huge meal during this time of plenty. Her pride sisters have already drunk at the pool and strengthen pride bonds with the ritual head rubbing greetings of the big cats. As successful as this group of lionesses is at hunting, it is a cruel irony that for five years not one of more than 50 cubs born into the pride has survived to maturity. This season, the hope of the pride's future lies with two of the younger females. They spend many days searching out the safest place to raise their young in the rocky hills to the north of the plains. One of the females has given birth in a well-hidden den in this area and at sunset she returns to her closely guarded secret. Two tiny newborn cubs. The lioness's predatory lifestyle allows her to carry the extra weight of pregnancy for only three months before giving birth. This short time in the womb results in very underdeveloped young who are virtually helpless for the first two months of their life. They will then rely on their mother and the pride for another two years before they are independent. The lioness is a gentle and patient mother, spending hours suckling and cleaning or just quietly watching over her babies. If danger threatens, she will defend them savagely, but there are times when she must leave and join the pride to feed. Young cubs left alone are totally unable to defend themselves, and these are dangerous times. If their hiding place is discovered by another predator, they have very little chance of survival. The other female has four older cubs who are ready to meet the rest of their family. The trip into the outside world is filled with adventure, and like all young cats, they are highly inquisitive and playful. The rest of the pride has been feeding on a giraffe kill for two days when the newcomers arrive. It is a perfect opportunity for the cubs to meet their relatives and begin their education in life with the pride. They are thoroughly investigated by their aunts and soon learn who will play and who should not be irritated. The territorial male is paying a visit to the pride to take advantage of a free meal. This is the first time he has seen his offspring, and despite their efforts to gain his attention, it is obvious that he is not impressed. The giraffe carcass has a huge amount of meat left on it and there is more than enough for the whole pride. With no danger of being injured while adults fight over food, the carcass becomes a playground in between meals. Meat in such abundance is a novelty and play and feeding carry on through the night.
In the morning, there is very little movement around the kill, and the cubs have eaten themselves to a standstill. At smaller kills, the competition for food is violent and dangerous for cubs. Sometimes, at interactions such as this, cubs are precluded from eating and can be injured or even killed. This experience will help them survive during feeding with the pride, but they have yet to encounter the greatest danger to their young lives, for stalking the plains of Savuti is another of Africa's most fearsome and efficient predators, the spotted hyena. The two main hyena clans are large and powerful, hunting brazenly in the territory of the lions. Sometimes they will tackle even the most dangerous of prey, like the Cape Buffalo. The hyenas run down one of the cows later in the day, where, unable to defend herself against the ruthless attack, she finally collapses from shock and loss of blood. Nowhere else in Africa is the rivalry between lion and hyena as intense as on the plains of Sabuti. And when Myomi's pride arrives, attracted by the noise of the kill, they are swiftly chased and attacked by the blood-crazed clan. The lionesses have no choice but to escape to the safety of the trees until their tormentors have left. In the months after the large herds have left Savuti, the plains dry out and food is harder to find for the animals that remain. The lion's prey is scarce and scattered into smaller groups. It takes a full effort to make even the smallest of kills. This is when the hyenas are at their boldest. And if the pride is not accompanied by protective males, the clan shows no fear, rushing in at the kill to snatch a hard-earned meal from the midst of the pride. this kind of interaction that has fostered the deep-seated hatred existing between these bitter rivals. <laughs> At this time of year, every sunset brings a possibility of violent confrontation in the dark of the night. One evening, we find the females leading their young across the middle of the open plains. It is obvious from the blood on the lionesses' faces that the cubs are being taken to a fresh kill. 
they have caught a large male giraffe, a great prize for these lean times. As the pride settles down to feed, Smudge watches over the family. But there are others living on the marsh who also need food, and it is not long before sinister shapes begin to gather on the fringes of the darkness surrounding the kill. The cub's presence here now places them in mortal danger. The lions continue bouts of feeding through the night. As dawn approaches, they are gorged, rolling on their backs to ease their discomfort and speed up digestion. The hyenas have begun to gather in numbers now and to still arrive from all directions. Myomi and Smudge try to keep them at bay, but as the sun rises, the enemy closes in. A savage two-day battle that will change the course of Myomi's pride forever is about to commence. It is only when the male arrives that the hyenas withdraw. He has killed a young, inexperienced hyena on the outskirts of the skirmish, and he shakes his victim with anger and frustration. The next day, it appears that the lions have abandoned the battle and their kill. The victorious hyenas squabble over their hard-won prize. For the lions, the fight has had tragic consequences. Smudge has been gravely injured and is separated from the rest of the pride. Her leg dangles uselessly from a torn and bitten shoulder. Her agony is apparent every time she tries to move. With her is one of the young cubs now the only remaining survivor of the new litter. Her brothers and sisters were killed somewhere in the night and she herself has been badly mauled. Instinctively, they both know that they must make it to cover before nightfall. Smudge heads for the rain tree at the edge of the marsh where the pride often meet up at night. As evening falls, she is within sight of it but is too exhausted to continue. The cub has made it to the safety of a low tree she will be safe here while she waits for the pride to arrive. Smudge eventually drags herself to the base of the meeting tree. It has taken her the whole day to travel less than a mile. The night is dark and dangerous for the cub, separated from the females for the first time in her short life. Smudge listens intently for the sound of her approaching sisters. When the rest of the pride arrive, silently emerging from the night, Smudge is overjoyed. She struggles over to greet and head rub as if ready to join in the hunt. 
For 12 years, she has set out every night, shoulder to shoulder, with her sisters and daughters. But tonight, for the first time, her broken body will not respond. And the pride cannot wait. The cub is strong enough to limp along and moves off with the females. But the pain is too much for Smudge. For a while, she struggles valiantly after the pride until she sinks to the ground, exhausted, calling mournfully to the night and the disappearing shapes of her lifelong companions. <laughs> Fate has dealt her a bitter blow. At night in Savuti, weakness of any kind is certain to attract deadly attention. The hyenas are quick to sense the helplessness of the stranded lioness, and their tentative approach soon turns into a vicious attack. The attack is suddenly broken off as the calls of more hyenas come from the marsh. This area is a territorial no man's land between clan boundaries and the noise of the attack on Smudge has attracted the attention of a rival group. Within minutes, the full might of both clans has joined the fray on the open plain in a frenzy of scent marking and running skirmishes. Hyenas are masterful opportunists, and the intruding clan exploits the attack on the lioness as a chance to gain some precious hunting ground in a divided battle. The attack on Smudge is forgotten, and she will live through another painful night. At dawn, with a last supreme effort, Smudge struggles to within sight of her family, who again move away from her. This is the last time she will ever see them. Her condition deteriorates rapidly over the next few days. One morning, after a soothing drink, she lays herself down to rest. The magnificent life of a queen of the plains is drawing to a close. Six months have passed in the Kruger, and the Munchi females have a new family to take care of. Two new sets of cubs have been produced as a result of the Pride takeover. The aged mother of Nialetti and her sister has rejoined the Pride and has resumed nursing duty for her new grandchildren.
The remaining youngsters from the original litter are almost fully grown and are learning to fend for themselves quite well. A lot of their food is still gathered from scavenging, and even the tattered remains of a leopard kill high in a tree are worth the concerted effort to recover. Adult lions are too heavy to climb, but these youngsters, driven by hunger, have no problem getting up to the kill. When the time comes to find a way back down to the ground, the haughty, regal bearing of the princess crumbles, giving way to a very unladylike scramble. No matter how meager this prize may be, it is sweet success for the cubs, who are now well on their way to becoming an independent pride. And it is not long before the youngsters are able to kill for themselves. Just before the end of the year, we witness the young females making their own opportunistic kill next to a well-used water hole. The survival of these cubs represents success in another of the complex cycles of nature. The Munchi pride has assured that the genes of their ancestors will be represented in this area by another generation. For Myomi's pride in Savuti, it has been a hard year. The loss of Smudge has reduced the strength of the pride, but nature has provided a balance for her death. The remaining female cub is the first youngster to survive in this pride for nearly seven years. She is by no means out of danger and must grow up without brothers and sisters, but she represents hope for the future of this family of queens and princesses. On her will fall the task of carrying forward this majestic line of royal blood.